Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Erin Pollard, the Project Officer for ERIC in the Institute of Education Sciences in the U.S. Department of Education, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to help you, our publisher community, understand what you need to know if you would like to have your journal or other materials indexed in ERIC. We're going to answer questions such as, what kinds of materials does ERIC index? What criteria do we use to select new sources for indexing? And what is our process to review new sources? We'll cover these questions and many more today in our presentation. Before we get started, I have just a couple housekeeping items. First, we needed everyone to reduce the noise during our presentation. If you have a question, please enter it in the chat box on the side of your screen. We will either work the answer into our presentation or address it at the end in our Q&A session. Also, we are recording this webinar and it will be available for viewing on the ERIC YouTube channel and in the multimedia page in a few weeks. You will be getting an email to let you know when it's online. We, are also, we also closed caption the presentation. If you want to turn off the captioning, please click the X by the media viewer. Today you're going to hear from two of us on the ERIC team, starting with me. I'm going to be providing an introduction of ERIC's sponsorship and mission and the wrap-up. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Fern Fresti, our content development lead, who will walk you through our process to find, review, and select new sources, and the standard and key criteria applied when selecting sources of education research content for ERIC. Then we will answer questions publishers have frequently asked, then we will open up the floor to respond to any questions that you may have. ERIC operates under contract with AEM Corporation, which is tasked with finding education research content to meet our selection policy, creating the records, and sending them to the department to add to the ERIC website. As stated in the ERIC selection policy, the mission of ERIC is to provide access to education research in a user-friendly, timely, and efficient manner. To do this, the department provides an easy-to-search digital library at eric.ed.gov. The ERIC records contain bibliographic citations, abstracts, and thesaurus terms for education research materials in selected journals, books, and gray literature produced by sources such as nonprofit organizations, centers, programs, and agencies. The current collection has 1.7 million citations, with approximately 400,000 records having full text freely available. ERIC is a revenue-neutral program. There's no charge to use the collection. Users may view the full text attached to an ERIC record if permission has been granted by the publisher, or use the direct link to the publisher's website. There's no charge to the publisher to participate, and ERIC does not pay royalties or fees to the publisher. Now I'd like to introduce Fern Frusty, who's going to walk you through key elements of the selection policy and the source review process. Thank you, Erin, and good afternoon, everyone. As Erin said, I'm going to walk you through how we review and select sources for ERIC, but I thought it would be helpful if I first define a few terms that we'll use during the webinar. Let's begin with publisher and provider. Since ERIC indexes a variety of materials, we occasionally distinguish publishers of printed or digital journals and books from providers of other non-journal materials such as reports, conference papers, briefs, and other gray literature. Our journal or book publisher may be a large commercial publisher, or it may be a professional association that produces its own open access journal. Providers tend to be report producing associations, agencies, centers, and other organizations. Next is the term source. We will be using the source quite a bit today the word source quite a bit today. A journal source is a journal that we've reviewed and selected for regular ongoing indexing in ERIC. For books, the source name is also the book publisher or a single imprint with a focus on education research. If we are indexing reports or other material, we refer to the association or the center producing the material as a non-journal source. In most cases, the name of a non-journal provider is also the name of the non-journal source. Content and materials are used interchangeably. This refers to the journal article, the book, or the report that is indexed. ERIC is unique in that in addition to indexing journal articles and books, we spend quite a bit of time locating the more elusive gray literature that is produced by nonprofits, centers that might be funded for only a short period of time, and programs. Our users know that ERIC will identify, collect, and preserve reports, briefs, and white papers, for example, and makes a full text available in ERIC if permission is granted by the copyright holder. During a review cycle, we consider all aspects, the publisher or provider, the source, and the material. If selected for regular indexing in ERIC, 
the ERIC record will represent the material produced. The ERIC selection policy is your go-to document to find the ERIC mission, statement, the general collection goals, and everything we will cover today. How we review and select sources, the standard and criteria we use to weigh every source during the review process. A PDF of the complete document is available by click clicking the Selection Policy link at the bottom of the ERIC website page. We periodically review this document to make sure it accurately and clearly communicates our policies and processes. When looking for new sources, we consider four overarching goals. Every source selected for ERIC must be related to one or more of the topic areas in the IES authorizing legislation and produce education research. We will discuss the topic areas further in a minute. We also seek to increase the number of sources that produce peer review content and increase sources that permit the full text to display in ERIC. We look for sources that produce material that is both rigorous and relevant. By rigorous, we mean material that presents a research method and approach that is reasonable and sound. By relevant, we mean material that must have a direct bearing on the field of education. As Aaron mentioned, the mission of ERIC is to provide broad access to education research, so we seek sources with a primary focus of producing content that contains education research. For an overview of the sources being indexed in ERIC today, as of March 1st, we are indexing 1,154 journals. There are thousands of education-related journals published today, but our goal is to identify and index only those with a primary focus of education research. We are also indexing 802 sources of gray literature and book material. A list of the journals and non-journal sources indexed in ERIC today is available via the links at the bottom of the ERIC website. So how does ERIC find journals and other sources to review for indexing in ERIC? The sources are either suggested to us or we've located them. We receive a majority request for review from a journal publisher representative or editor. And we also hear from representatives of associations, organizations, or centers. The publishers providing content indexed in ERIC are based in the U.S. and from around the world. Some are large publishers, such as Sage, Taylor & Francis, and Wiley, and others are small publishers, such as a professional association or a university college of education that publishes their own journal. For some, the journal is a commercial product that requires a subscription through their website for ERIC users to access the full text, and an ever-increasing number of journals in ERIC are open access. Requests for review are also received from researchers, librarians, educators, and other ERIC users. ERIC has a collection advisory group, and they may suggest a new source. And of course, the ERIC team is regularly searching and identifying new sources to review. You may wonder how to suggest a new source. Anyone may send an email to ericrequest.ed.gov or use the Contact Us form on the ERIC website. In addition to the source name, it is helpful to receive your website URL and, if you're suggesting a journal, the ISSN for us to confirm we're reviewing the intended journal. We will contact you if we have any questions. You do not need to send sample content when you suggest a source. However, if needed, we may ask you to provide content or temporary online access for the purpose of reviewing the content. You may wonder what happens when someone suggests a new source. When we receive a request to review a source, we send an email response to acknowledge your request, then we add the source name to our list of suggested sources that we maintain and the information you provided, including the name and contact information of the person who sends the request. The only action we take immediately is to validate or locate the website URL to make sure we have a good link to information and content for the suggested source. Fairly soon after a source has been suggested, a staff person will conduct a preliminary review. We confirm that the website is in English, and if the journal publishes in another language as well as English, we validate that at least 80% of three recent issues are in English. We make sure there is current content and record the year of the most recent issue or report. We also confirm that the content is education related and the type of material produced by non-journal sources is acceptable. 
If all of the basic criteria are met, we should assign the status of suggested for review to the source. This means that it will move forward to be reviewed during the next formal review cycle. If the content is a mix of English and another language but does not hit the 80% benchmark, or if the content does not seem current, we may assign the status of watch. This means we will conduct a preliminary review again in a few months. If none of the full text is in English or the content is not education related, we may assign the status of no further review. This means that it will not be looked at again unless we receive another request to review it. We're often asked how long the review process will take. The review cycle takes two to three months to complete. So for each source, it will depend on when we receive your suggestion. We do not review sources outside of the formal review process. And if your source is assigned a status of watch during the preliminary review, we may not review it again for six months to a year to allow time for you to publish two to three more issues or several more reports. Another question we receive is whether Eric will consider indexing a brand new journal. The answer is yes. If it is a good fit for Eric, we would like to begin indexing it fairly soon. Our working policy is that a minimum of three issues have been published and are available for the review process. If the new journal is only published annually, we may review it when two issues are available. If you're wondering what type of gray literature content we index, I would like to refer you to two tables in the selection policy. The first table is called Types of Material Indexed, and the other is Types of Material Not Indexed. We have tried to make our working policy very clear, but please let us know if you have any questions about a specific type of material. ERIC conducts the formal review process twice a year, and it may take up to three months to complete. We receive a large number of requests and may consider about 200 sources during each review cycle. We begin by conducting an analysis of the current collection. How many sources selected during a previous review cycle are currently indexed in ERIC? How are they contributing to the topic areas? This helps us to identify underserved areas. And from this point, we can set our collection goals for the upcoming review cycle, such as a desire to increase peer review sources or add more content for a specific topic area. Then we visit the source's website to gather information that we'll need to complete the review. If not yet collected, we locate the ISSN, a direct link to an archive of content, and whether the source has a peer review process in place. We read the aim and scope statement, browse the table of contents, and read abstracts or full text for three to five current journal issues. If we find there is a pending name change or a move to a new publisher, it will not move forward. Instead, we change the status to watch and we'll consider it again during the next review cycle. For non-journal sources, we read the mission statement and review several current reports. When we have gathered information and reviewed the aim and scope, abstracts, and possibly the full text, we apply the standard of being relevant to one or more education topic areas. The topic areas represent the field of education and include the 16 topic areas that were covered by the former Eric Clearinghouses, plus closing the achievement gap, and educational practices that improve academic achievement and promote learning. We assign one or more of these topic areas to every source record our observations, and determine if the source will move forward in the review process or if we'll change the status to watch or no further review. We do get some requests to review sources that have nothing to do with education. Once we've confirmed that the suggested source meets the standard of being related to education, we consider our selection criteria of quality. The materials produced by a selected source must be complete and usable as presented. Working papers may be accepted occasionally provided they are free of track changes and are not watermarked as drafts. For integrity, we must be able to determine that the source, for example a journal, owns the material and has the right to distribute it to us. The material must have substantive merit in that it addresses the area in a professional or definitive way. And it must be relevant or important to the current issues in the field of education. 
Our next question, once we have determined that the primary focus of a journal or center is related to the field of education, is whether the content contains education research. By research, we mean original presentations of empirical, empirical or data analysis, literature reviews or summaries, presentations or critiques of theories, or logic models that can guide practice. We look for content that outlines the methodology used, includes analysis of data, well-formed arguments, and has a reference list or citations. By education research, we mean the field of study that examines education and learning processes. We look for content that examines effectiveness of educational programs, practices, and policies, and includes research conducted for the purpose of improving the quality of education. We often get recommendations for sources that contain subject matter research, but ERIC does not select sources that only contain subject matter research. For an example, a journal of chemistry would not be a good candidate for ERIC, but a journal of teaching chemistry would move forward in the review process. If the source produces a combination of education research and subject matter, we determine that the primary focus using the 80% benchmark again, is education research. We may make an exception and selectively index journals with less than 80% if we need to increase coverage for a certain topic area. Some critical observations made during this phase will determine if the source moves forward or if we will watch the source until review cycle or if we determine that it is not a good fit for ERIC. Next, we consider other selection criteria. Let's start with peer review. We accept both peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed material for indexing. However, as mentioned earlier, one of our goals is to increase peer-reviewed content in ERIC. To determine if a source is peer-reviewed, we research the publisher's website to locate a description of a blind or expert peer review process. ERIC does not accept an editorial or internal review process for the peer review indicator on the ERIC records. For language, the full text of materials indexed in ERIC must be available in English. For a journal to be reviewed for ERIC, the full text of 80% of the articles in each issue must be in English. And if selected for ERIC, 80% of the articles must continue to be in English. For material format, we must be able to receive the material in an acceptable electronic format such as PDF or XML. We do not index content that can only be provided in print or if the content is only available on a website in HTML. We also look at editorial and publisher policies and processes. We like to find information about the manuscript review and selection and take a step to confirm that the content produced matched the stated aim and scope statement. The final element is sponsorship. We note when a journal is sponsored by a professional association or a center producing non-journal content has been funded by the U.S. Department of Education or a foreign government agency. Sponsorship is not a requirement, but preference may be given to a source with sponsorship. These criteria are all more fully explained in the selection policy document, and we would be happy to answer any questions you might have at the end of our presentation. By this time, we will have a list of good potential sources. We review the notes we've taken along the way and even look again at the abstracts and full text to confirm our intended decision. We will ask a few other questions to create our final set of sources to recommend. Is the content highly relevant to the current issues? If it's not open access, is there adequate access to the full text for ERIC users? Our benchmark for this is that a minimum of 30 libraries subscribe, as we've found in WorldCat. What percentage of the content is education research? Is it 80 to 100 percent per issue, or does it barely meet the benchmark of 80 percent? And are the research methodology and results clearly presented. Some journals we've reviewed have a very broad scope, so in this final step we consider the editor's selectivity. Do all articles relate to the stated aim and scope? And if English is not the native language, is the English translation easy to understand 
and the grammar excellent. And when reviewing sources other than a journal or book publisher, we verify that the center or agency publishes acceptable types of material. As I've mentioned previously, the complete list of types of material we index is in the selection policy. We are now ready to review the observations we've made during the entire review process and assign a final status to each source. The candidate sources that are education research and meet all of our criteria and collection goals will be recommended to the department to select. We will provide a list of these sources to the department along with the background information we've collected, links to the website, and links to sample content. If a source is fully reviewed but not recommended, we may assign the status of watch and include it in a future review cycle. For these sources, the content may seem to be a fit, but there might be some hesitation. Perhaps the percentage in English is not consistently 80% or higher, or the issues contain a mix of subject matter and education research and the percentage is not consistently education um, research is not 80% or higher. Sometimes the source appears to be suspended. For example, they publish four times a year, and as of March, they haven't yet published the last issue from the previous year. Or perhaps we found a few broken links or other problems with the website, but the content seems to be a fit. And if we have a concern about access to the full text, we will assign the status of watch and review it again in a future review cycle. The number of libraries subscribing may increase, or it may change to be an open access journal. We assign the status of no further review to any source that does not meet the standard and criteria we've just discussed or has a critical problem, such as the website suddenly disappears or the source is closing or ceased. For sources that will be recommended to select, we determine the starting year of coverage in ERIC. Our working practice is to begin indexing journal issues or documents that were published a minimum of two years prior to the year the source is selected. However, we may consider on a case-by-case -case basis and a recommendation to vary the starting year of coverage may be provided to the department. Examples of what may cause a different recommendation is if the first volume or document was published just shortly before the two-year time frame. If we wish to increase content for an underserved topic area, such as rural education, we may also expand the time frame, or if they've granted permission for the full text to display in ERIC. We also decide whether a recommended journal will be indexed comprehensively, which means every article in every issue is indexed in ERIC, or selectively, which means we will review every article to determine if it is a fit for ERIC. This decision is based on a review of three current issues to determine the percentage of education research versus subject matter content in the issues. In the two examples on your screen, we index Journal of Learning Disabilities comprehensively, or every article is chosen. We index Journal of Adolescent Research selectively, and in this representative issue, we've selected three of the five articles for indexing in ERIC. In addition to pure subject matter, we do not select articles that just relate to children, but select the articles containing education research. For our non-journal sources, all materials are indexed selectively. We will review every report, brief, or book to determine if it should be indexed in ERIC. So at this stage, what happens next? The department will consider all of the information we've provided for the recommended sources and make the final source selection. When reviewing the source recommendation, Erin looks for the same elements that I looked for earlier. Mainly, are the articles or documents education research? Are they from a source that produces high quality, relevant information? And how do the sources fit into the existing collection? If your source is selected for indexing, you or the appropriate publisher or provider contact will receive an email communication from Erin with an agreement form attached. This agreement is between the publisher or the copyright entity and the U.S. Department of Education. The form on your screen is the front page of the agreement for journal publishers. We also have a form specific to book publishers and another for centers and organizations. 
When the publisher or provider representative receives the agreement, they should review it and complete the optional sections. The agreement includes several standard sections. The first states that we wish to receive or have access to your content in electronic format for the purpose of creating ERIC records. In Section 2, you will have the option to display the full text in ERIC immediately after an embargo or not at all. Other sections include a statement that the publisher retains all copyright, that we will attach full text content to the ERIC record or link to the publisher, and lists the responsibilities of the licensee and licensor. The agreement also includes a statement that the ERIC database is intended for educational purposes and the use of your content to include records in ERIC does not imply an endorsement of the publisher or the content. Section 7 mentions the process for adding another reviewed and selected source to your agreement. The selected source will be listed on the agreement, and if you have another journal, you may not add it to the form, but you could request that we also review it. Section 7 mentions that the agreement automatically renews to smoothly continue indexing your content in ERIC until you or we decide to terminate the agreement. The agreement language is comprehensive, but Section 9 is available if there is any specific language that you feel would be important to add. The last page of the agreement is pre-populated with a source or sources selected for ERIC. If it is a journal, we will include the ISSN and the peer review status, as well as the starting year of coverage. The publisher that wishes to participate will complete Part A and provide the publisher customer service information that we will place on your ERIC records. In Part B, you will provide contact information for up to three publisher representatives. And in Part C, indicate if you would like us to download the content from you your website, or if you will send the content to us, and then check the type of format we will be receiving. Then the pu appropriate publisher contact should sign the form. We will accept either an electronic signature, or you may print off the form, sign, and scan it, and then email the agreement to eric at ed.gov. Aaron Pollard, as the department's representative, will review the form, countersign it, and email a final copy to you for your files. We will update our agreement management system with all of the information you've provided and will record the options you've chosen. With the agreement in place, we are ready to acquire or receive the content and begin indexing your material in ERIC. You can expect to see records representing your content after about six to eight weeks after we first receive your agreement. This slide shows an example of a brief ERIC record with a PDF of the full text attached, and the second one includes a direct link to the publisher. When you click on the article or the report title from the brief record, you will see the complete ERIC record. Each record will contain the article title, author, source name, bibliographic citation, and an abstract, either one that you've provided or one that ERIC has written. At the bottom of the record, you will see descriptors. These are ERIC thesaurus terms and the publisher customer service contact information. Now, Erin and I would like to cover a few questions we're often asked, and then we will open the floor if you have other questions that we haven't covered. For the first question, um, will ERIC provide feedback on why your source wasn't selected? The answer is yes. We would be happy to tell you the status of your source or why it wasn't selected. We receive a very large number of requests to review new sources, and at this time we are only contacting publishers of selected sources. We typically send these emails containing the agreement to add new sources to publishers in July and January. If you haven't heard from us after this time frame, you may contact our help desk to find out if we've reviewed your source yet. If the review is complete and it was not selected, we will include the reason in our response. We hope that the selection policy, this webinar, and other multimedia pieces we've created will help you understand the criteria that we use to select sources. Another question we receive is what happens if you change the journal title. If we have not yet selected your journal, please let us know so we can update our suggested source list. 
If we are indexing your journal, please notify us as soon as you know of a pending title change. We will quickly review the updated aim and scope statement and the first issue published under the new title. If it is a minor change to update to currently used terminology, we will be able to continue indexing it without conducting a formal review again. You will not need to sign another agreement. Instead, we will associate the previous and the new source name in our system and link the new name format to your current agreement. If there has been a significant change in scope, or if your journal merges with another journal that is not selected for ERIC, we will pause coverage and we will review the journal again during the next formal review cycle. Next, a similar question is, will ERIC continue to index the selected journal if it moves to a new publisher? The answer is yes, if there is no change in scope. We will contact the new publisher and establish an agreement with them to ask permission to continue indexing the journal without a gap in coverage. Okay, thank you, Fern. Another question publishers often ask is whether we can provide usage statistics. This is something we're hoping to make available in 2019. However, at this time, we do not have the capability to provide usage statistics to publishers. And the last question that we've prepared is whether or not you need to do anything for ERIC to continue indexing your content. The agreement to index a selected source automatically renews each year, so if you continue to publish content that meets our standard and criteria, ERIC will continue to index it without requiring any paperwork to continue. If we notice that there's been some type of change, such as a change in scope or increase in non-English material, we may look at it again in a review cycle. If we find a source no longer meets the ERIC selection policy standard and criteria, it may be discontinued. If that happens, we will contact you with the reason we will stop indexing your content. And the records that, will, are, that are already indexed in ERIC will remain, and you may request another review after you um, begin publishing content that complies with the selection policy. Um, so we now, what we'd like to do now is to answer any other questions or comments. So please enter them in the chat box on the right of your screen and send them to us. And what we're going to do is we're going to first answer general questions about this specific webinar, and then we're going to open up to any broader questions. So our first question has to do with, do we index material from another database that collects third-party materials? So would we index something from a clearinghouse of another resource? And the challenge here is that we need to get permission from the copyright holder to index something. So we, even if you have very valuable content, we are not allowed to index materials um, without going directly to the publisher. So if you have a database um, and you, or a clearinghouse or something, we are unable to index that content. Okay. So the next question, the articles must be about education, or can we publish articles about sports sciences? Um, so we are funded by the U.S. Department of Education, and in our authorizing legislation, Congress requires us to index education research. So all material must be education research. Um, and the threshold is when we're looking at your journal um, or non-journal material, are 80% of the articles in your journal, um, education research. Okay. Um, is there any percentage limit of education articles? So again, we're looking at 80% threshold, um, but everything that we index is going to be education research um, because that is what we are authorized and funded to do. Okay. Um, are there, our publications are currently indexed in ERIC through 2016. How do we make sure our newest publications are included? So I'm going to be turning this over to Fern. I'm going to answer the first part and then turn it over to Fern. Um, so the first part is to check your agreement and see if you're, how are we supposed to get your content? If you are going, if you are supposed to be emailing us content, I would check to see if you actually have. Um, frequently what we have found is that people are supposed to be emailing content and um, forget to. As uh, someone who formerly worked on the publisher side, I had no idea that that was my responsibility. What we encourage you to do is to contact us and say, can we switch the site download instead? And that's where the ERIC team will go out to your website and download the material and you don't have to send us anything. 
If your agreement currently says site download and we're checking into the individual who asked, um, then we typically review your website twice a year and that, um, so you may see a gap or two, but if it's more than like six months, reach out to us um, because that generally shouldn't happen. So, do you have anything you want That'd to That'd be great. No, the only thing is, um, for this specific um, one, if you would send an email to um, our help desk, and then I will I will send you a direct response about where we are with that one. Great, thank yeah. you. Okay, so the next one is going to be a reviewer's employees of Ed um, Ed, or do you utilize volunteers? If the latter, can people apply to be a reviewer? So the answer is, I'm going to apologize for being the bureaucrat, um, due to the Anti-Deficiency Act, we cannot accept volunteer, voluntary services. Um, it's actually not allowed. Um, so the reviewers are Fern, who is a contractor under um, a contract with the Department of Education, and then me, who is an employee. So we can't accept volunteers, but what we can accept is if you nominate sources, um, and that would be wonderful, and just send them to our help desk, and that way we kind of keep a catalog and we make sure that they all go to the right place. Along with abstracts, are keywords useful? Fern, do you want to answer that one? Um, the, um, the processing team can use keywords if it's um, included in an XML feed, um, and sometimes I've noticed keywords are included on the, um, like a journal article PDF. So I would say if it's included, we will use it, uh, but don't, uh, don't necessarily send it separately because that wouldn't be in a digestible format. Okay, so then comes, if journals are currently in print only but can be converted to PDF easily, would they be considered? So part of this is when you say could be converted to PDF, do you mean that there's two issues. If you convert it to PDF and send it to us, and it's a readable PDF, then that's one thing that, that can be considered. If you are proposing mailing something to us or faxing it to us, we don't accept um, materials that way and we don't make the PDF. Um, so everything indexed in ERIC has to be a readable PDF. Um, but if that's something you're willing to do, that we would be open to reviewing that journal. So. That'd be right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So then, all right. This specific one I'm going to be turning over to Fern, but to read it to you, there is a journal that is a biannual publication. The last issue was published in December 2017. Um, the next is not due until July 2018. Um, will that be a problem? Yeah, no, I'm, I'd, I'd recognize this title. Um, as long as we have um, two or three issues that have already been published, then we'll be able to do the review. If the December 2017 is the only issue so far, then we'll need to wait until the fall um, to look at that particular journal. Okay. So then, as an editor of an online journal, if it's partially open access and partially mem members only, would it be considered for indexing? Yep. Well, we love open access. Um, and let's explain why we like open access. I think that this is something that typically may not make sense um, to our community is that we have found that a lot of ERIC users are not necessarily reaching out for the 2018, 2017 content. They're looking at materials that are 10, 15, 20 years old. And um, 10 years from now, your website may have gone down or changed. And if it's behind a paywall, users may not be able to find that information. So why we prioritize open access content that we can display in ERIC, it's so that way users can find this material 10, 15 years from now. And so we encourage you to allow us to display the full text. Immediately would be great after an embargo is also wonderful, and it can be an embargo of your choosing. It can be a five-year embargo um, after the profits of that new article typically Peter out. Um, so we encourage you to consider that as an option, and if it is, let us know in the review cycle um, when you're nominating your source, but it's not a requirement at all. Well, and I might, I might insert here, too, if it's partially open access and partially member only, um, we would um, look at WorldCat to see how many 
library is subscribed so that the if we index the articles that are abstracts only online, um, that our users would be able to get at some point, some way to the full text. Okay. okay. We have published our first issue in December. The second volume will be published in June. Um, you can send the suggestion to us and provide that information and then we will um, well, probably do schedule you for the fall. By then you'll have two issues available so that um, we'd be able to to have you on our on our list for the fall review. Okay. And so then what XML formats do you prefer? Not so um, okay. So I guess I'm the one who look up. I'm gonna be the one who gets the answer. <laughs> we have Eric has his, their own preferred XML format. Um, however I can say that Almost none of the publishers use it, and we are flexible. And if you're selected, we will work with you to find the right format. Yeah. Um, and so we, if it's something that traditionally what will have happened is we'll either build our system to take what you have, um, or we'll say, just send us a PDF, it'll be easier that way. Um, a follow-up question is how would a journal be suggested if it's currently in print only? You would email it to us, and preferably with the PDF. We, yeah, we would need a sample mm -hmm. attached. Yeah, sample content. Um, are Eric index publications available in Google Scholar? If so, there. If they are, is there a delay showing up in the search results? Okay. So, Eric, this is going to be a little long one to answer. All of Eric's metadata is made freely available to anyone, anyone on this phone, any user. Google has the same access as um, EBSCO or PerQuest as do you, um, the general public, and the publishers. So yes, I know that Google Scholar happens to index stuff. It's based off of our sitemap, not our metadata, which is generally updated every time we index records. Um, I know Google Scholar is always very keen to make sure that the sitemaps are updated, so there may be a delay. Um, but the delay is, for Google Scholar specifically, is slight, um, like no more than a week or two. For what you might see in other search providers that index data of our metadata as opposed to our sitemap, um, you may see a month or two or longer delay because it's up to when the publisher chooses to index their material. All right, when you mention readable, are you including accessibility features for 508 requirements, right? We do. Um, um, so as a federal government, um, yes. When I said accessibility, I was referring to if something is 508 compliant, which is a government term for a PDF that means that it is accessible to those who are using a screen reader. Um, a 508 compliant PDF is our preferred and is required on federal websites. Um, but what I was meaning when I said readable and accessible is if you think back to 10 years ago, it was much more common where you would have a PDF that would be like a scan from a scanner and you couldn't search the words inside um, the PDF because it was just an image. We can't index those in ERIC, um, and the reasons for that are long and complex, um, but we want to make sure that our content is accessible to everybody, and so it's in proper reading order, and if it is something that has been created in 2018 um, from digital content, it is almost always considered accessible, even though it may not meet the 508 compliance threshold. Okay. Um, Mm. Website changing. Yes. For if your website's changed, please let us know. So what will happen is um, that will also change your URLs on previously indexed records. We will go back and update that as resources are available, but it won't be immediate. So, um, but definitely please email us um, through the contact us list. So one, we have the new information, um, and two, that we can update old records. Um, 
Okay, uh, the next one is about someone who has sent in a suggestion um, for application in 2015. Um, what you can do, if you'd please send a, a message to the help desk and ask for some direct feedback about uh, the status of your review and if it's um, if it hasn't been selected, then I'll, I'll give you some very specific, um, some specifics about uh, the observations we've made and whether or not we're going to review it again this spring. Okay. Then there can be several WorldCat records from the same journal. Do you mean, do you sum the library accounts? Answer is yes. 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 We, we look for that and um, we keep track of which have, um, which libraries have subscribed to print versus electronic, and then we add them together. Okay, so that is all the questions that we've gotten so far. So we're going to just give it a minute to see if we have any new questions. Okay, um, you haven't mentioned a DOI member number as a criteria to be selected. No, we haven't because it's not a requirement. However, um, if you have a DOI, that is wonderful and that will be included in um, the ERIC record. All right, the next one. Is there any percentage of educational articles? So... You, you answered that. Yeah. Yes, yes. It has to, there has, it has to hit the 80% um, benchmark. If, if there is a topic area, typically something like urban education or rural education, where we um, are always looking for more content, then we may, if you refer back to the other slide that uh, we talk about comprehensively or selectively indexing, then if a journal has at least 50% um, education research articles, uh, we may um, select it and then we will, what we'll do is we'll pick out and only index the education research articles. Okay, we're going to have one more minute to see if there's any other questions. Okay. okay. Go to the so, next slide. Okay, the next slide. And um, we have several videos, infographics, and recorded webinars in our multimedia area on the ERIC website. To find all the items, click on the use this link or click on the multimedia um, link at the bottom of the ERIC website pages. And I've also included a link to the selection policy um, and the journal and non-journal list. These links are all easily found in the footer of the ERIC website. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciated to get to talk to you, and please send us any questions that you have. Thank you.